American soldiers, these Ivy men of the 4th Infantry Division, were dealt a tough hand in the Vietnam War. It was their lot to draw the almost impenetrable jungle of the 2nd Corps area near the Cambodian border to face the elite regular North Vietnamese Army. Assigned to a narrow corridor honeycombed with North Vietnamese units operating all the way from the Cambodian border to the coastal plain of South Vietnam, the courageous Ivy men carried the war to the enemy and faced him toe-to-toe -to -toe for a slugout that ended in triumph for the 4th Infantry Division and a greatly expanded area of influence for the 2nd Corps. This is the heroic story of the 4th Infantry Division in Vietnam. During two earlier wars, the 4th Division had built a solid tradition of courage and the capacity to overcome the enemy. Organized in 1917, the Ivy Division, so-called because of the Roman numerals and its name, earned campaign streamers at the Marne, Chateau Thierry, San Miguel, Verdun, and the Argonne Forest. In World War II, they spearheaded the drive along the Siegfried Line and were heavily engaged in the Battle of the Bulge. They were the first to smash ashore on Utah Beach. The first to set foot on German soil and among the first to enter Paris. And now the 4th Division was in action again, this time in Vietnam. In the summer of 1966, more than 3,000 men of the U.S. 4th Infantry Division arrived in Quy Nhon, on the coast of South Vietnam, to continue the American buildup in that beleaguered country. The advanced contingent stepped ashore. They were welcomed by the Vietnamese and by their commander, General William C. Westmoreland. They then boarded buses to the airstrip for the last leg of the journey to their base camp near Pleiku, within the Second Corps area, which was located between the Cambodian border to the west and the South China Sea. The 1st Cavalry was already established in a narrow corridor at An Khe, but seasoned North Vietnamese army units in regimental size controlled the great bulk of the area. The Central Highlands, difficult terrain made up of jungle, mountains and waterways with the highest incidence of malaria in Vietnam. This was the lot of the 4th Division. The division base was established at Dragon Mountain, renamed Camp Inari, after Lieutenant Mark S. Inari, the first Ivy officer to fall in Vietnam. The rainy season was just beginning, and operations were severely hampered. But neither the weather nor the harassing enemy could deter the Ivy men, who were determined to make the area their own. The engineers arrived with the division's advance party and quickly began to carve at the base of Dragon Mountain in what would soon become a city in the jungle.
with security details always on alert against sudden attack, the men of the 4th cleared the area and established their quarters. Mortarproof bunkers and fortifications were built. Metal runways were set down for aircraft landing strips. And roads were slashed through the jungle to keep convoys rolling and troops on the move. Within little more than a year, the Ivy Division base camp contained more than 900 buildings. The harsh countryside was peopled mostly by Montagnards, a nomadic people who slash and burn clearings in the forest, farm it for a time, then move on. Harassed and terrorized by the Viet Cong, these simple folk fell victims of a time and circumstance they could not fathom. A need to evacuate the Montagnards to safer areas became apparent as enemy activity increased around their villages. A program was evolved for the resettlement and care of the Montagnards. In each move, the entire village was lifted bodily, huts, belongings and all, and transported to a more secure location. The men of the 4th Division helped to create a tight bond between the Montagnards and their country. Ivy men swept through the steaming jungle near the Cambodian border, seeking to block North Vietnamese regiments who periodically dashed across the border in hopes of a quick victory. Often, small units of ID men would suddenly clash with overwhelming numbers of the enemy, who pounced with swift ferocity. When the big guns of the fort were called in for support, and the heavy lead began to fly, the North Vietnamese Army, the NVA, disengaged as quickly as they could appear. In that autumn and winter of 66, the enemy were often able to elude our pursuing fighters. We hit them from the air. They were adept at camouflage and could only be flushed on the ground. But if that's what it took, the Ivy men were ready. They embarked on a series of search and clear missions to locate the enemy and to rob him. The big mobile guns continued to do their share in dispersing the enemy. In operations like this and similar actions in early 67, the powerful partnership of heavy mobile guns and IV infantry combined to pin down large enemy units and methodically beat them into the ground. Operation Sam Houston grew out of an attempt by the Viet Cong to interrupt work on a vital road being built from Pleiku to a special forces camp near the Cambodian border. The road building crew had been the target of numerous mortar attacks and the scene of violent firefights. Despite intelligence reports of a large mass of NVA units, elements of the 4th Division moved through difficult terrain to meet the elusive enemy. zones in the dense jungle, and areas had to be cleared before resupply ships could bring in supplies and take out the sick or injured. The 
this was the only physical link with the outside. Choppers were called in for all types of assignments. Top priority went to combat assault missions. To spot enemy concentrations under the umbrella of dense jungle foliage, light observation helicopters were used. Once they located the enemy, the light spotters called for their big brothers, the heavily armed Huey gunships. These choppers pack an impressive resource of firepower. The gunships strike quickly, with uncanny accuracy and formidable power. Their presence on the scene was welcomed by the ground troops below, who moved in quickly to exploit the gunship attack. For the NVA, this technique was a costly experience, resulting in a great loss of men, installations, and equipment. While their buddies hacked and beat their way through the thick jungle in the north. The 3rd Brigade of the 4th Division, working with the Vietnamese Army, was assigned to War Zone C along the southern waterway. In the winter of 67, this task force spearheaded the action in Operation Cedar Falls. Positioned along the southern sector of the Saigon River, a mechanized battalion of Ivy men was charged with a twofold mission to engage in clear and hold operations along the river and to block the escape route of fleeing Viet Cong. As so often happened in the course of their mission, Ivy men uncovered a rich cache of rice left behind by the VC, which was airlifted out for distribution to the South Vietnamese. Hard on the heels of Operation Cedar Falls came Operation Gadsden, in which a battalion of Ivy men fought together with elements of the 25th Division. On one of their many sweeps deep in the jungle near Cambodia, they succeeded in taking a division-sized Viet Cong complex. At first, the Americans had met heavy resistance, but on the second day, they moved in and found that overnight, the enemy had abandoned the area. The complex was there to be taken. At the same time, within the 2nd Corps area, the 4th Division concentrated on expanding its area of influence. With determination and tenacity, they hit the enemy with tremendous firepower. Between contacts with the enemy, the existence of the 4th Division was characterized by long periods of watchful waiting. With time for relaxation. And time to do the hard work that needed doing. Then, all at once, short but brutal pitched battles. That was the pattern until, in April of 1967, the 1st and 2nd Brigade moved into Operation Francis Marion while operating from bases nicknamed Jackson Hole and the Oasis. The objective was to screen and guard the strategic border west of Pleiku. Throughout the extensive operation, units of the Fighting Fourth had clashed with the well-equipped North Vietnamese troops infiltrating into South Vietnam, moving men and equipment quickly into place to block enemy forces wherever they chose to cross the border.
during the operation, massive artillery was employed. More than 400,000 rounds hit the enemy where it hurt. This devastating firepower was a major factor in quelling the enemy offensives and in demoralizing the NVA forces. Division enjoyed the successes of Operation Francis Marion. The Ivy Men of the 3rd Brigade swung into Operation Cook. Convinced that most of the villages and hamlets in the area around Duck Fo were either Viet Cong or sympathetic to them, the 3rd Brigade undertook an intensive search operation. Countless tunnels and holes in the area turned up Viet Cong supplies and prisoners. But along with the spoils, the Ivy men had to pay a price for victory. In the fall of 67, a North Vietnamese army regiment moved into the Yadrang Valley from the sanctuary of the Cambodian mountains to threaten the special forces camp at Play May. An area sweep was undertaken. Contact was immediately established. NVA patrols were particularly active around roads, but round-the-clock IV operations effectively neutralized the threat. The men of the fort succeeded in blocking the NVA thrust to destroy Play May, while simultaneously blocking thrusts as far south as Ban Mi Tuc. At the same time, intelligence reported a heavy enemy buildup in the dusty, inhospitable valley near Dok To, 55 miles north of Pleiku. The Ivy men quickly responded to the challenge, moving the infantry battalions of the 1st Brigade into the rugged mountains near the Cambodian and Laotian borders. found the enemy dug in along all major terrain features. True to their tradition of courage and daring, the men of the 4th worked their way up enemy-held hills. With an airstrip at Dak Toe under constant attack by 122mm rockets, Ivy men slugged it out in the surrounding hills in sharp pitched fights against a shrewd, well-trained, entrenched enemy. The final battle at Dak To occurred on the northern slopes of Hill 875. And on Thanksgiving Day, in the fifth and final day of the assault, they hit the hill continuously with their Artillery. and mortar rounds. Air Force strikes destroyed whatever cover the NVA might have used in defense of their position. Against all odds, Ivy men air assaulted Hill 875, cutting off a vital supply and withdrawal route for the North Vietnamese. In doing so, the fighting force proved they could win a major confrontation with NVA regulars. The support of all units was vital to the success of the battle. The cry, Medic, shouted on the battlefield, threw into operation the most sophisticated facilities known to man in wartime. Within moments of the call, medics were on hand to treat and evacuate the injured. During the Battle of Dak To, the Ivy men fought against five North Vietnamese regiments. This involved three U.S. brigades.
supported by 17 batteries of artillery, resulting in more than 1,600 of the enemy killed in action. Throughout the rugged central highlands, the most significant battles were for the hilltops, since the force that controlled the hilltops controlled the valleys below. The 4th Division fought to seize the most strategic hilltops for fire bases. This meant several days of saturation airstrikes. And artillery fire. After the infantry had forged its way to the top, a bunker-type perimeter defense was constructed. Followed by a land clearing operation. When completed, the hilltop was a barren, dusty knob protruding from the valley floor. But even then, the area was by no means secure and had to be defended against enemy assaults. Combat patrols were sent to seek out and ambush the enemy. Forward observers pinpointed enemy positions for IV artillery. While in the valley, pursuit of the NVA continued. Contributing to the victory at Docto were the big tanks and tracked vehicles of the division's armor. These rumbling giants brought new dimensions of firepower, mobility, and shock action to the ground fighting. A Viet Cong ambush on a convoy was abruptly turned into a rout when tanks and armored personnel carriers moved into action. In short order, they had the enemy on the run. At one time, military leaders believed that the use of armor in the jungle mountains was impractical. But a tank battalion, two tank-laden cavalry squadrons, and a mechanized infantry battalion fulfilled a variety of successful missions with the 4th Division. These included search and clear, fire support, perimeter defense, road security, convoy protection, and service as a mobile reaction force. Thanks to its impressive record, Armor and mechanized infantry became an integral part of the military posture in the Central Highlands. The month-long Battle of Docto, part of Operation MacArthur, was the turning point for the 4th Division in the 2nd Corps area. But they continued to fight the enemy wherever they found him. At Linlock, harassment of the evasive enemy was almost a daily occurrence. In the Antennae Valley, after lacerating enemy artillery fire, Ivy men were sent out to engage an NVA force of battalion strength. Again, the phantom enemy evaporated when surprise and favorable odds were not his, leaving behind considerable arms and equipment. and numerous graves. In the Antennae Valley, too, a vital landing zone had to be secured so that needed communications equipment and supplies could be flown in. Units of Ivy men closed in on the NVA positions and met with heavy small arms fire. But in the end, the enemy was neutralized. 
and the landing zone secured. As the struggle went on, a new enemy buildup in the Docto area was reported in the winter of 68. Troops of Ivy men were airlifted for an assault on Strategic Hill 1049. Wave after wave of helicopters lifted the fighting men into the assault. Moving with the precision of a well-integrated combat force, the seasoned Ivy men forged their way through enemy-held positions and took the hill in five sorties. From their newly won hilltop advantage, the men of the 4th were then able to send out numerous short-range reconnaissance patrols to locate the enemy and report their position. Mortar fire was then poured into the positions to pin the enemy down. in with rockets and raking machine gun fire. This combination of superior firepower and mobility prevented the North Vietnamese from mounting even one major offensive in the area. Thanks to the short-range reconnaissance patrols and their supporting units, threat after threat to the 4th Division area was eliminated. The 4th Division has been eminently successful in the Central Highlands. Within two years, their zone of influence increased tenfold, covering some 10,000 square miles of rugged terrain. That's the story. The success of the 4th Division's mission was due to the dedication of young men working as a team. Each man was totally devoted to the job at hand and to his fellow soldier, dedicated to give the best that was in him, because that was the best way out for himself, too. The 4th Division, answering its third call to arms, saw its duty in Vietnam's Central Highlands and did it with dignity and distinction. The officers and men of the seasoned 4th Infantry Division stand fully prepared to defeat communist aggression and give the people of South Vietnam the opportunity to live in peace and in freedom. Throughout Vietnam, the ivy patch is worn proudly by ivy men and feared by the enemy.